Now let's talk about how we sense and perceive food, because clearly um, that will determine what we eat and how do we know what we should eat. But to understand how we recognize and identify things that are disgusting, we first have to understand how our brains see and perceive. By the time we actually become aware of what it, whatever it is that we're looking at, a lot of actual pre-conscious visual processing has already taken place in our brains. Before we become consciously aware of something, our subconscious brain actually recognizes the salient features of the object we're looking at, and it automatically routes the visual information to appropriate conscious recognition, uh, uh, brain recognition centers, and that then will tell us what we're looking at, and this is illustrated by how we see and perceive faces. Now, by the time you actually became aware of that picture, not only did you know you were looking at a face, but you also knew whose face you were looking at. And that's because in all of our brains, not only do we have facial recognition centers, but those centers are connected to memory cells that recognize specific faces. So that by the time that information is forwarded to the conscious centers uh, in our forebrains, we already know who we are looking at. And the, the, that ability of recognizing uh, um, faces is so strong, we even recognize this cartoon as being the same person uh, 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 in the actual photo. Our propensity to see faces is so strong we are able to see faces in line drawings and even in the craters of the moon. And that's because again, our brain is hardwired to see faces because faces are so important in our social interactions. Well, correctly identifying and appropriately responding to potentially nutritious food items is also critically important because an inappropriate disgust response to food will lead to an eating disorder, which will lead to starvation, will, which will lead to death. And that kind of seems um, almost um, intuitive or uh, axiomatic, but you really have to step back and think about that. Because if we as individuals or as a species are not able to recognize what is food, we won't know what to eat. And if we don't know what to eat, then we will starve to death. And this is actually illustrated um, in the eating disorder, anorexia nervosa, because the fundamental defect in that eating disorder is that the women, or excuse me, let me not just say women, because we now see that um, uh, even young men uh, with body dysmorphic uh, disorder um, can develop uh, have developed anorexia nervosa, they actually develop an, what's uh, considered an inappropriate disgust response to food. And even though they are actually starving to death, when they look at food, they are so disgusted by the idea of eating that they have literally no desire to consume food and they will just waste away until they can actually starve themselves to death. And so it is truly possible that if you cannot recognize uh, food as being necessary and nutritious, that, uh, and if you develop a dis an inappropriate disgust response to a food item, that you will not want to eat, and if you don't want to eat, you will starve to death. Well, the, rec the mechanisms that we use to recognize food are similar to those we use to identify, uh, or excuse me, the mechanisms we use to recognize faces are similar to those we use to recognize uh, and identify uh, food. To avoid evoking a disgust response to potentially nutritious food, our brain uses pre-conscious visual cues to invoke what um, I call food interest attention 
to appropriate items. The brain is able to do this because of the perceptive properties of the human eye and the, and the neural wiring of our visual cortex. The human eye is designed to perceive color and very fine detail. And, you know, people often try and compare human eyes to carnivores because we have binocular vision. Carnivores have binocular vision, but the human eye is is very, very, very different from the eyes of carnivores. And it's, uh, you know, thinking that just because we have binocular vision and carnivores have binocular vision, that that means that our eyes are the same would be like saying, well, eagles have wings and hummingbirds have wings, therefore they eat the same food. It's an idiotic premise. Um, the wings of eagles are, are very different from the wings of uh, uh, hummingbirds and so are the eyes of uh, humans and carnivores. Again, the human eye is designed to perceive color and fine detail. Carnivores don't see color, they see in black and white. And I'll talk about their eyes a little more. Uh, and they also don't see, see detail very well. I'll talk about that uh, um, a little bit more later. Um, and the color, uh, the reason we, we perceive color is because uh, as a plant-based species, color is extremely important um, for us because plants signal the edibility of their edible parts with color. When the, the, their plant parts are at a state where they are not ready to be eaten, the plants um, um, will uh, have them in a color phase that says, don't eat this yet. It will be bitter. It will be toxic. It is not something you should consume. Um, and it turns out that much of our incredible visual processing uh, ability comes from the stupendous computing power of our visual cortex. Now, one of the things that I want you to notice from this picture of the human eye is that the, uh, that the human eye has an area in the back of the retina called the fovea, which is a pit located at the back of the retina that contains the highest concentration of what are called cone photoreceptors. It is the cone photoreceptors that give us both the uh, ability to see very fine detail, but also color vision because uh, uh, the cones come in three different varieties and it is the um, three different, the combination of uh, the three uh, um, primary colors that gives us all of the uh, various uh, uh, colors that we see. 70%, and this is amazing, 70% of the neurons in the brain, in the human brain, um, which is proportionately the largest brain of any animal on the planet, uh, are connected in some way to our visual cortex. Uh, humans can see a range of over 10 million different hues. Uh, we can rapidly shift from deep to near focus, as well as easily, easily switch from panoramic viewing to looking at something in exquisitely fine detail. And um, we likely um, see um, um, in greater uh, um, close in uh, um, uh, color and hue discrimination than possibly any other animals. Now, it's, it is true that um, uh, birds and raptors are able to um, uh, see uh, um, uh, um, much uh, uh, greater, uh, um, uh, they, they have kind of like super binocular uh, uh, um, uh, uh, vision in terms of being able to see things uh, from much greater distances, but it's unclear if they are able to see the kind of color discrimination uh, um, and uh, so forth that we are able to see. Um, and it's likely that they don't because it wouldn't be important to them uh, for finding food since they are not looking for uh, food from, uh, um, uh, from plants. Hummingbirds might though, um, that's something uh, that'd be interesting to find out. Our visual neuro neural wiring causes us to see and perceive schema, looking for patterns and forms in the detailed information picked up by our phobia. And this kind of vision is very helpful when looking for food from plant sources, since plants 
tend to package their edible parts in very showy and stereotypical forms, such as fruit, seeds, pods, leaves, roots, tubers, and so forth. And although, uh, as I mentioned earlier, mammalian carnivores do have binocular vision like us, their eyes are constructed very, very differently from ours, and they see the world in a very different manner than we do. Pattern oriented color vision would be a distinct disadvantage for a predator because it is actually more easily deceived by camouflage. The eyes of carnivores don't have trichromatic color vision because their retinas uh, only have a limited number of one uh, or possibly two, type of two types of cone photoreceptors. Um, their eyes contain mainly the monochromatic rod photoreceptors that function best at night because they typically are active at night. Um, they also have a layer of um, mirror-like reflective cells at the back of the eye behind the rep their retinas called the tapetum lucidum that amplify low light levels. And that's why if you shine a um, flashlight into your dog or your cat's eyes or other carnivore's eyes, their eyes light up um, uh, because of the, that mirror at the back of the retina. Uh, and that is what allows them to see well uh, in the dark. They have their own built-in uh, night vision goggles. And then instead of a pit at the back of their retina that giving them uh, discrete uh, um, detailed vision, they have what's called a linear strip that runs in a horizontal uh, um, uh, streak along the back of um, their retina is called the visual streak. And that visual streak means that anything moving across that visual streak will stimulate them to go into chase mode. Um, and it allows them to easily track movement, but it will also cause them to chase anything moving across the uh, visual streak. And that's another reason they tell you if you're ever confronted by a carnivore out in the wild, never run from the animal because they're going to chase you. They can't help it. They're hardwired to chase things that move across that visual streak. And uh, again, as I said, that tapetum lucidum, uh, that mirror in the back of their eyes is what amplifies uh, any light entering their uh, retina and um, gives them such good vision at night. Uh, and they see uh, six times better than we do. And they literally have built-in night vision goggles. Carnivores see in a black and white pixel mosaic that again is geared towards detecting movement. So when things move across that mosaic, they pick it up very, very easily. And so for carnivores, motion, anything moving is the visual cue that stimulates food interest attention in them, which makes perfect sense because they're trying to find something to eat and they're trying to find something living that they can kill and eat. Predators are hardwired to chase anything that moves because if something is moving, it can probably be eaten. Um, and uh, carnivores don't have a catalog of edible animals um, in their brains um, or a list of, you know, what species exist. So they have to be ready and able to chase anything that's moving and to kill it and uh, see if it uh, uh, is edible. And that's why they chase balls and, and, and ropes and uh, even cars and tires because, you know, they have to be ready to chase down anything that comes across their path that's moving to see if it's edible and can be eaten. Um, because that's how Mother Nature designed them or God, uh, um, um, if you happen to, to um, believe in God as I do, um, uh, so that, uh, you know, they could be always out looking for a meal. Often carnivores and true carnivores will actually begin feeding on their prey while it is still alive and moving, which for um, uh, human beings would be incredibly gross and hideous to do something like that. Natural meat eaters are actually stimulated by bloody raw flesh and true predators always willingly eat putrid rotting flesh and in fact um that is something that attracts them um uh because they have the stomach acid and the immune system to deal with the pathogens 
uh, uh, in uh, rotting tissue without becoming sick. These animals will kill without reservation or remorse. And if the prey is perceived to be weak, sick, or vulnerable, um, like uh, young or very old or disabled animals, that will make them uh, chase and kill the animal even that much more. Whereas for human beings, because of our moral disgust impulse, uh, attacking weak, sick, or vulnerable individuals generally uh, is viewed as abhorrent uh, um, within uh, our societies, um, unless you happen to belong to the GOP. Now, again, when you contrast that, that with the way humans see and perceive food, it turns out that for us, we look for something very different. Edible plant parts are generally very brightly colored, smooth edged, discreetly shaped objects that are small enough to be held in our hands. And so in order for items to be see, perceived as potential food sources, therefore, they must be smooth edged, discreetly shaped, symmetrical, and preferably hand sized and colorful. Keep that in mind, okay? Edible plant parts, generally brightly colored, smooth edged, discreetly shaped objects, small enough to be held in the hand. And so for items to be perceived as potential food uh, sources for us, they must be smooth edged, discreetly shaped, symmetrical and uh, hand sized and colorful. Those are the characteristics that our brains perceive as uh, uh, visual cues that signal food and good food um, and therefore stimulate food interest attention in us. And that may be one of the reasons that women paint their lips like this luscious, ripe red color, because it's very likely that that full red lips mimics the, the appeal of ripe fruit and will stimulate uh, men or if they are in their girlfriends to wanna you know, kind of eat or kiss the lips. And although sight, uh, this is from uh, uh, Scientific American, says although sight plays a less direct role than smell and the perception of flavor, sight is the sense most often used to identify food in humans. And it thereby affects the expectation of the food's attributes. And so just imagine that you're out uh, hiking with some friends and you guys kind of get lost and um, you don't, uh, and you, you guys are hungry. You're not sure where you are. Um, uh, and all of a sudden you look out in the distance and you say, oh man, look, there's a tree and it's got a, a bunch of red round things on it. And uh, immediately you start to get hungry because you think that that tree is loaded with fruit. Um, and, and so you start heading out in that direction and your expectation is that you are going to get some nice, delicious apples because of those red round objects uh, 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 in that tree. Um, and uh, because that the sight of the red round object stimulates food interest attention in you. And here's just some pictures of edible plant parts showing that they are smooth edge, brightly colored, discreetly shaped. Here's some more uh, edible plant parts. And uh, in addition to this, for an object to be perceived as food, it must not only have the uh, characteristics you just mentioned, but it must also have the smell, taste, and texture of plant and plant parts. And very importantly, it must not be moving. Nobody wants the food on their plate, squirming around, looking at them and screaming. That is just a hideous idea. <laughs>